The subject matter for which I have been tasked to present before you this morning uh, is one that I, I've always had a, a keen interest in, and um, I have drawn uh, general insights about African theology, uh, first of all from researching other scholarly works uh, by African theologians who have grappled with the subject matter and uh, uh, will try to draw on uh, their insights and those insights which will uh, help us uh, to think about things like theological training methodology that is relevant for the Africa we are currently uh, serving in. And I am praying that uh, this context will lay down the foundation and give us an opportunity to analyze and speak into the matters arising. And secondly, from a specific Zimbabwean context, uh, which has given me a vantage point from which I have observed through my own research, the interplay between the Shona and Debele traditional religious culture and Eurocentric theology. I believe that by analyzing that interaction and its outcomes will give us an opportunity to, to perhaps evaluate our missiological methodology in indigenous contexts uh, all over the continent of Africa and maybe even beyond. And so um, let's begin perhaps by uh, defining African theology. I think African theology, uh, we can say most commonly refers to the systematic working out of theological issues which pertain to Africans. And beginning in the 1960s, the conversation about the indigenization of Christianity or the working out of a distinct African uh, identity within African Christianity developed uh, into the many branches that one may call African theology today. And even though it's difficult to define uh, one set of characteristics for this movement, there are a few paradigms that uh, one can identify, uh, maybe at least four of them, African contextualization theology, identity theology, African liberation theology, and uh, perhaps African feminist theology. And these different approaches all have a uh, collective relevance uh, in terms of helping to analyze uh, what African theology is. The roots of uh, the African theology movement seem to trace back uh, to the efforts of uh, uh, some uh, theologians, uh, men like Henry Venn and others uh, in the 19th century in the attempt to work out uh, relevant objectives for uh, the missionary movement of the 19th century began to think seriously and uh, call for the indigenization of the Christian faith in Africa. The ideas, however, were poorly reflected uh, in, in missionary endeavors all over the continent. However, the efforts set forth the stage for the key questions that made African theology possible to be asked. And it is true that African theology has some of its roots and ideas uh, uh, coming from uh, the idea of indigenization, but still this may not be the prominent driving force for the development of African theology on the continent. The influence of modern intellectual African thought has much a role to play on how everything played out. The intellectual life in Africa for more than a century has focused itself on one formative experience, and that is Africa's encounter with the West and Africa's reaction to that encounter. And as, as life progressed on the continent, the old god of political leadership and intelligentsia in Africa uh, was pushed to the sidelines by the new regiment of Africa's new elite scholars. And uh, these new educated uh, scholars uh, emerging during the colonial period uh, were the ones who championed the the overthrow of uh, colonial regimes and set forth a new direction in, an, in intellectual thought. And the Africa that resulted was then shaped to the needs and intentions of Africa's new educated elite. Hence, Africa's post-independent intellectual life has been symptomatic of the preoccupations, the commitments and anxieties and values of this new class of Africans. And this new order sought above all at a material level African development and rapid modernization. And at an ideological level, they sought to affirm their own African identity and traditional heritage in order to contest Western cultural dominance. And so the issue of, of, of authenticity and self-reliance in combination with a comprehensive critique of the West and its role in Africa has functioned as the main dynamic for Africa's intellectual life uh, 
in almost all fields of learning and expression in the latter part of the 20th century and moving on into the 21st. And this has been true for literature, sociology, political science, anthropology, philosophy, history, and theology. So in a nutshell, in the past, the current preoccupations of African theology have matched the dynamics of intellectual thought in Africa. Now let's uh, come to a more uh, specific context uh, where I'll share some of my research with you pertaining to uh, the characteristics of Baptist ecclesiology in Zimbabwe, where I come from. And to aid our discussion, um, we'll look at a general summary of observations put together of Baptist churches in Zimbabwe. And I would like to highlight what I observed uh, and describe as Christian bubbles. And having visited a number of Baptist Union churches around the country, I noticed a certain pattern which was not distinct at first, but most certainly uh, became apparent. That the central churches, uh, the ones we call the central churches, are the uh, churches in the, uh, in the cities, in the, in the urban areas. Um, they seemed to be uniform in their ecclesiology. They seemed to be uh, uniform in the way they did church and um, seemed to display more of a distinct Baptist DNA. Uh, and those in the uh, high density areas, however, tended to vary. Um, some were uh, distinctively Baptist in the way they did church, but some of them were not. They, they tended to become a bit different. And um, as we moved on into our rural congregations, uh, they were much worse in this regard of a lack of uniformity, with some congregation even uh, displaying uh, very Pentecostal attributes. And the reasons for uh, this dynamic um, are not obvious. I cannot say for sure at, at the moment. But nonetheless, allow me to focus on the characteristics that I observed in these divergent congregations when I attempted to analyze them collectively. These Baptist congregations shared some similar traits in their ecclesiology. These are either small or even medium-sized ch church communities that are generally not missional in their ecclesiology. Their liturgy does not include an evident outward focus and seldom are their programs evangelistic. It's often a mystery as to how any of them found their way to church in the first place. Well, not really. In the history of many of these type of churches, there is a well-meaning Baptist missionary. There are also some common threads in character of leadership style in these churches. Most are mainly deacon board uh, led congregations and these deacon boards play an eldership role sometimes with the pastor as the main leader. And in some cases, the pastor is subordinate to the deacon board. And if, or rather, when they have a falling out, the pastor may be fired if he stands his ground, there may be a split in the church resulting in two smaller congregations. In many cases, the conflict has resulted in physical violence or was taken to the police or to court. In a number of these churches, elders kind of played a vestigial or ceremonial role. And I discovered there was, in some cases, there was no biblical criteria used uh, to appoint elders except that they were very old. <laughs> in, in many of them, it seemed evident that the pastor viewed the church as his lifelong occupation and way of sustenance, hence the grooming of new leadership, is often the cause of falling out or church splitting into two congregations. This dynamic may replicate itself over and over again. Hence, a number of small Baptist churches you will find in Zimbabwe were the result of church growth by church splitting and not necessarily church planting. The saddest reality about these small churches and why I call them bubbles is that they have no credible witness of Christ in the communities which they are planted their church life is divorced from the social and religious concerns of the communities in which they exist. And instead, they come together as members during Sunday services, funerals, and weddings, kind of like special members-only clubs or spaces in the community where Christian life is experienced if one dares to venture inward. And these congregations keep their church life and their day-to-day -day life separate. There is a, almost a common understanding that church life is, is, is just for that. It's for church. But when life gets real, they have to get back to the real world where real life issues that can't be solved by praying have practical solutions. 
The local church is for them a community to identify with on Sundays and midweek meetings, but does not interfere or influence day-to-day -day life. Case in point, I encountered a girl in Kadoma, where I come from, who was a witch doctor, but a member of a Baptist church. My own grandmother was the same too, even though she was Anglican, she would go about her spirit medium duties during the week, and on Sunday she was at church, and she, she would even preach. And so this kind of syncretistic lifestyle, I discovered, is not a nuance of the 21st century church, but maybe a worldview that has been handed down over a number of decades. Way back in the 1900s in Zimbabwe, there were Christian villages. The two motivating factors which led to the creation of these small uh, Christian villages and communities, number one, from the missionary's point of view, was the idea that the indigenous Christians were unable to maintain their Christian lifestyle whilst living amongst their pagan brethren. Number two, perhaps, was the ecclesiological teaching of communion put into practice, that as the ex-church has done, they had to live together, love one another, and share their lives together. And so the solution, after encountering uh, some difficulties with evangelizing the Shona and Debele people, the solution was to take them out of their cultural context and put them into these bubbles, into these spaces where they could experience the Christian life unhindered by their culture. And uh, just to give you an example of the, uh, the difficulties and the mindset that led the missionaries to come to this decision, I will give you two quotes, uh, one from a, a Jesuit missionary who was in Matebeleland, which is the southern part of Zimbabwe, and uh, one from another missionary who was in Mashonaland, um, uh, in the Shona part of the country up to the north. And I open quote, Ndebele are so preoccupied with the materialistic aspects of life that it is useless to talk to them about the soul or this destiny. Most of them, he wrote, do not believe in the existence of an immortal soul. Death is for them the end of all things. It is futile to talk to them about heaven and hell as their reaction invariably is, who has seen heaven? Who has seen hell? The Ndebele have no intention of giving up their pagan habits and submitting to the law of God and his church for the sake of future happiness or to escape future punishment which they disbelieve. And in southern Mashonaland, where they encountered the most stubborn resistance to Christianity, according to O'Neill, open quote, these older Karanga have no high thoughts, no wish to be lifted up of their degraded state, and absolutely no desire that their children should be educated, still less they should embrace Christianity. The missionary, therefore, has no hope of doing anything with the children. And nearly all the fathers have sold their daughters, even small children, in marriage to some heathen. And so you find because of the difficulty, because of a clash in culture between the early missionary and the local people, uh, the strategy was to then remove the ones that would have accepted Christianity out of the villages and out of these cultures which they thought could not be uh, uh, permeated by the gospel into Christian villages. In Zimbabwe, the two most prominent of these Christian uh, settlements are Chishawasha and Epworth. They are now uh, high-density suburbs. I've uh, discovered they are still owned by the Methodist Church and the Roman Catholic Church, uh, respectively. But now how, how this influences or links in with the current ecclesiology and the characteristics uh, and this syncretistic kind of worldview uh, that I am talking about that I witnessed in these Baptist churches is this. When the missionaries took the African converts out of the villages, they failed to resolve for the villagers how the gospel could take care of the cultural issues back in the village where his kin was. If there was a Ngozi, what we call is an avenging spirit in the family, the African converts tended to go back to the village to help their families take care of the problem as best as they could via appeasing the ancestral spirits, and then they would return back to the Christian village. 
This syncretistic worldview seemed to be embedded in the congregations of which I speak of. For the early Shona and Devila converts, this may have come about as a result of this trying to remove the African from all that was African so that he could receive the gospel. And this is what Hybert means when he says, the suppressing, open quote, of old cultural ways without addressing them results in these practices merely going underground, close quote. There is a common element which surrounds these uh, small churches, if one cares to observe kindly, is that they are viewed by the African convert in the same lens as did their early predecessors, as offering a Jesus that could not speak into the real issues in African culture. The result of this paradigm that separates Christianity and African life have been devastating on Zimbabwean ecclesiology. On the other hand, the influence of some strands of African theology and attempts to create an African identity within Christianity have also had adverse results for Zimbabwean Baptist churches. For these present day Baptists which I speak of, there were many factors evident that were responsible for their strangeness. But by far the most insidious of them I identified was that at some point there was an attempt to over contextualize the gospel in such a way that African cultural traditions and religious beliefs were misrepresented and baptized to fit into Christianity. And this was evident even in their theology, which displayed traits of dualism, animism, and universalism. This also seems to be the same axis on which African initiated churches in Zimbabwe operate. And and so, because of this, one of the biggest problems in the African church in Zimbabwe is syncretism. Now, I'd like to give some cultural background to help us understand the behavior of the uh, African Zimbabwean Christian. And I was quite, uh, quite surprised to hear from uh, Dr. Adioy's uh, talk that it seems that this these dynamics are also the same in their context. And so why do our congregations uh, flock to the traditional healers and the mega church prosperity gospel? Understanding African culture and religion can help us to understand the way of the African church today. Without that basic understanding, the things that are now shaping the way church is done in Zimbabwe will always be a mystery to us. In Zimbabwe, traditional religion, it was not the privilege of everyone to approach the God. A medium or a witch doctor or a clan leader would do so and the rest of the people would know the will of this God through a single person. This person would perform the rites and the duties needed and would have a secret higher knowledge. So in order to get favor from this God, people would come to the person of power, pay a goat or some price, and the one would petition the God on behalf of the many. This medium was regarded as having great powers to perform miracles and affect the supernatural world. A witch doctor, for example, was a healer and a seer. You could not come to him empty-handed. Otherwise, your petitions could not be passed on to the spirits. And naturally, because society was wrought with many wars, the sacrifices kept coming. And this usually meant that whoever these go-betweens were, they became the wealthiest and most influential people in their communities. This is similar, of course, to how Israel related to God in the Old Testament and how Christ became our last priest and go-between. But I observed another dynamic caused by this history that has not necessarily created a point of harmony between African traditional religion and the gospel a dynamic that has not served the purpose of preparing the indigenous people to receive the gospel, as some early African theologians may have viewed these similarities to do. If we look at the churches in Zimbabwe that teach health, wealth, and prosperity, and the ones that are African-initiated apostolic sect, where some of our convents would gladly go to have their problems sorted out, we may realize that our efforts to take them out of the cultural settings into these Christian bubbles did not take care of the religious beliefs which are and are still embedded in their hearts. In some African churches, the ecclesiology resembles early African animism. So the Shona traditions that may have served as a preparatio evangelica as others have hoped they may, 
neither did so nor gave the African church a more biblical ecclesiology. Because of this rooted worldview, Zimbabweans find it easy to follow a prophet or a, an apostle or a man of God. Because it has always been the way of the African traditional religion, it's the way that we have always approached deities through a man of power. People find it easy to bring things to this person. Because again, in African traditional religion, if you did not bring anything for the wish doctor, your petitions could not be heard. And people find it easy to idolize and even uh, worship the one person because it's not a foreign idea for human beings to ascend into being spirits and deities in African traditional religion. When one went to the wish doctor, the wish doctor always gave them an object, a token to be used in completion of one's deliverance or success for whatever they had been seeking. It could be water, a stone, some oil to rub, or some other sacred object. Zimbabwean Christians have made the retail of holy merchandise a huge success, and I strongly believe that not because of a shallow exegesis of James's text, but because this sort of practice is and has been our way of reaching out to the spiritual for centuries. African religion so cunningly infused into the New Age church with biblical embellishments, and this kind of Christianity is syncretism. African tradition and religion has always held the man of power with great reverence and almost worship-like reverence. Christianity, on the other hand, gives us a great God who lowers himself even to the point of becoming a man, suffering and dying on a shameful cross by choice. He radically changed the world by his teaching. He taught his disciples that if they wanted to be greatest, they had to make themselves least. He said things like, in my own words, you see, guys, the kings of the gent and the Gentiles rule over and have authority over the people, but you will not be like them because the greatest among you will be like the lesser. He that is chief among you must be the one serving. The Jesus of the Bible does not look anything like the all-powerful megachurch prophet to the African eye. He was indeed powerful, yes, but in his ways, nothing like ours. And his government, his kingdom was manifested very differently from the kings of his day. Physically, he was touchable, reachable, and nothing prevented Jesus from being a totally vulnerable human being. And we see this as he was taken and nailed on a cross. Now, this misconception, this idea of a powerless Jesus that the Africans in my country have may be the same as in your context as well. But was it because we showed Jesus films in the villages and summed it up by a five-minute prayer of salvation without adequate biblical discipleship to follow up? Did this give the Shana and Debella people the idea that the church, like it's Jesus, was good, yes, but still powerless to save them from the real issues they grapple with in life? The Baptist missionary was known for helping in other ways, like teaching about the life of Jesus, giving food aid and education, but when there was a Chidoma or Kapondiwa, which is evil spirits, <coughs> killing people in the family, everybody was generally convinced that going to the Baptist mission won't help. You have to go back to the village where the men of power took on these spiritual evils head on until they were solved. Then you return to Reverend John at the Baptist mission and sing hymns from the Reformation era. So by virtue of the results, it would seem, my brothers, that Africanizing the gospel to date for these people in my country has played no significant part in correcting this misconception of Jesus Christ as a powerless savior in the African context. African theology and its theologians hold the burden of bridging the gap between culture and the gospel. The bridge isn't one that can only be built by finding points of similarity from the African story and wedding them with the gospel to make the African feel more at home. No, this bridge needs to be built by confronting the African with the cost of following Christ and the radical nature of the gospel to upset his worldviews and God forbid not, not to turn the African into a better African, but a brand new Christian who also happens to be African. Oregon, Augustine, Tertullian, Paul, Martin Luther, John Calvin. What strikes us most to remember these men is not where they came from, 
but the way Christ used them regardless of where they came from. It is my prayer that after African theologians have come and gone, that even though as Africans we have had our brush with the fight against the suppression of our identity, that despite that we may be known in similar regard, not only for having been African, but for having been Christ-like. That what strikes people when they interact with the African churches is not that they are African in every regard, but they are biblical and share the distinct and universal identity that all Baptist churches around the world are known by. I hope that we here can begin to feel the burden and to ask the questions seriously. I also that hope whatever prevailing trends may be in your context, this discussion may intersect with all of us at different points that hold up our collective burden for Baptist witness in Africa. Many African Christians in Zimbabwe are members of small local Baptist churches and many of those small churches we have planted. But the truth is many of the people in these churches are not biblically literate. So can we synthesize this interplay between the gospel and African theology so far? The question needs to be asked. If the move to radically contextualize the gospel for African communities satisfied the longing for African identity and freedom from Western cultural dominance, which I agree was necessary, after all was said and done, were we able to produce a robust biblical theology in Africa, one that is not only authentically African, but also truly biblical? The achievement of African intellectual endeavor have been extraordinary since independence in multiple fields, including theology. Africans have thrown off external dominance and asserted Africa's own perspectives successfully. Yet as we move on into a new century, there is still a gaping chasm between African ecclesiology and biblical theology. And the change in Africa's post-independent circumstances <coughs> brings with it a need for change in its intellectual requirements. The quest for authenticity and self-reliance is now proving to be an anemic driving force for the current and future needs of the African church. Africa did indeed need to reclaim its identity and cultural heritage, and the modern mission movement has done immensely well to enculturate and contextualize. And I have encountered and worked with many Western missionaries who have gone above and beyond their duty to be Afro-sensitive and without hesitation have immersed themselves in African culture in order to reach the many they were called to love. These men and women, I have no doubt, like many of you here, I applaud. And it is such an honor to serve alongside you and all the glory we give back to God. But the current form of African ecclesiology tells us something we need to take heed of. That perhaps the Marxist critique of African theology was not without point. That if the agenda of African theologizing does not challenge African rooted worldviews that at their core run con contrary to orthodox biblical teaching, will cease to be relevant to, be to building the future of African communities. That if African theology can art produce for us an African who is able to carry out the missiological mandate that is now required for Africans. That African theologizing will cease to be relevant for our current context. Now can African theology surmount its own limitations and restructure for the requirements of a new era? If African theology cannot speak into the current ideological preoccupations of this modern Africa, then in its current form, may cease to be authentically African and relevant in that respect. As an illustration, may I refer to the development of systematic theology during the patristic era in the then Hellenized world. Patristic theologians concerned themselves with confronting the ideology of Neoplatonism, which was dominant in that culture. The philosophy and ideas of Neoplatonism were so prevalent in the Greco-Roman world that many faithful theologians could not avoid interacting with them. In fact, many of their conversations were framed in terms of Neoplatonic beliefs. The great ecumenical councils of the early church, such as Constantinople, Chalcedon, expressed biblical beliefs with Neoplatonist perspectives. Leading theologians of the day, such as Clement, Oregon, Augustine, 
also expressed themselves in terms that were familiar to Neoplatonists. Faithful Christian theologians in the Protistic period did not allow their attention to Neoplatonism to supplant their basic commitment to the true gospel. They held strongly to biblical truth. The dominant religious and cultural beliefs of the day gave patristic theology its form of expression, but did not deviate it from the core truths of the gospel. As we would expect over the years, this form of expression and emphasis did not remain the same. Scholastic theology then developed with forms and expressions that spoke into the dominant ideas of people like Aristotle and the philosophies of logic. The early reformers focused on a male protestant theology. All these developments were pushed forward by always re-evaluating the matrix on which to build a relevant theology for the context. Some of my African brothers may disagree with me here, largely because Africa has such a plethora of contexts that have come up as a result of many different factors and experiences. But I put it forward today that the motivations behind the birth and growth of African theology during the 1960s, which spoke in terms of identity, selfhood, indigenization, and liberalization, were indeed appropriate to speak into the current ideological preoccupations of the African continent in that day. But I don't believe Africa still has the same philosophical preoccupations. And I don't believe that African theologizing has stayed committed to maintaining a biblical precedent in all areas that it has affected. As for the paradigms African theology has chosen to operate on so far, I say it has neglected many key focuses. I dare say if we cannot admit that African theology to date has not summarized the full story of Africans, we are indeed guilty with the rest of the world for perpetrating the single story narrative of Africa as articulated by Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie. The story of Africa isn't only one of colonization, struggle, and the reclaiming of traditional heritage. There are other stories, some now with more pertinent consequences to the work we have all committed to do in Africa for the kingdom of God. What are the current philosophical and ideological preoccupations of Africa today, and how are they shaping the way Africans do church? And since Africa is at the cusp of a great missiological campaign, how can we develop, restructure, or reform our theological curriculum to equip Africa for this task? If African theology is to remain relevant to the advancement of the kingdom of God in Africa, it will need to take heed to responsible criticism of its more characteristic limitations. And those limitations can be structured into two substantive judgments. Number one, that African theology has tended to misconstrue its foundational question, and that African theology has only then generally attended to answering only half of the question it has framed. The defining mat matrix in which a valid African theology is to be constructed and against which of its achievements it should be measured is neither Africa's intellectual quest, nor Africa's cultural context, nor Africa's traditional religions. As crucial as all these may be, the nature of the enterprise requires that the defining matrix should be the present Christian community of Africa. Modern day Africa has a full range of needs and expectations and preoccupations, including quite importantly, the issues that have been raised by African theology to date. But we are discovering that there are others as well, some of more considerable consequence to the future of African ecclesiology. Secular humanism, prosperity teaching, corruption and the fight for democracy, human rights, moral relativism, universalism, feminism, liberalism, LGBT rights, urbanization, the list goes on. To the extent that African theology developed its task to correlate the gospel with African culture or with the preoccupations of the educated African of the 1960s, it has always functioned from an inadequate axis. Its parameters should be constructed to encompass the life of the contemporary African Christian community as that community seeks to fulfill its calling under God within its context and to the ends of the earth. And as I conclude, the task to synthesize the gospel with this African context was crucial indeed, but should always have been seen as half the question pertaining to African Christian existence. It is not enough to ask how Christianity may become more authentically African. 
but it needs to be asked how African Christianity may become more authentically Christian. And I believe it is by attempting to work out these questions that we can develop the framework from which to build a valid African theology and attempt to design contextualized missiological methodology in a way that can produce a robust African theology that is truly African, that is relevant, and that is truly biblical. Thank you. I think in a nutshell, uh, it wouldn't serve the purpose for me to uh, try and hash out and list out uh, Baptist distinctives. I'm assuming we're all Baptist in here. But uh, I think the, the, the important thing is the authority of scripture in relating to and challenging uh, uh, African Christian worldviews. So that's the main thing. And every other thing can be drawn out of that, the authority of scripture. Okay, it's not, it's not against a, uh, the Eurocentric version of the gospel. I mean, the basic idea of contextualizing here is realizing, first of all, uh, and this is what African theolog theologians in the beginning realized early, is that the Eurocentric gospel came with it elements of European culture. So in their bid to move away from that and to Africanize the gospel so that it can be truly biblical but seen from an African lens is what I'm talking about. Now that endeavor uh, to Africanize the gospel um, is where we're seemingly having issues that a biblical precedent has been thrown down in the process. So we're not wanting to move back to a Eurocentric gospel, no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying let's keep it a, uh, an Afro-sensitive gospel, but one that is indeed truly biblical. How do we do that? I think that's a question for all of us. <laughs> How do we, I'm going to throw that one back at the floor. <laughs> with, you, with theological uh, training schools, how do, we, uh, how do we look at our curriculum and see whether it is indeed producing? Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example for us. We were discussing this on the way here uh, with my colleagues. We realized that at some point our curriculum is, 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 is not, it's not producing that kind of uh, leader. So we, I think for, for us, and maybe for many of you, we may have to start there. I think the, uh, the core of our ecclesiology should, should be the gospel. And uh, all the other tears that come out of it, how, how we express what we believe should not be dictated in terms of a uh, European worldview, which has been a big mistake in the past, but it can be uh, thoroughly an African expression of those beliefs, as long as those beliefs are rooted and centered in, in the gospel. I would say we're looking for a more biblical ecclesiology. We want the foundational beliefs to be uniform, in terms of biblical orthodoxy. So I want to be able to uh, uh, root my uh, ecclesiology in the Bible the same way you do, but accept the fact that it's not going to be expressed the same way. Our forms and expressions are going to be truly African as much as yours are going to be European or American. And we need to accept that and not try to adopt these forms and ex expressions into different contexts where they they become strange or meaningless. I think it's, it's the same questions that I have, is, is how, do we, uh, how do we begin to move in that direction? And for, I think for many of us in the different situations and contexts that we have, there may be different strategies. Um, but you know, again, when we were discussing this, I think the one thing we came down to was um, looking at the students at our seminary was, I think it, it has to start with the student that we're churning out, and which means we need to uh, extensively look at, at our curriculum um, and maybe some, find some sort of way of correcting the misconceptions that you know, people have about, about Jesus, about salvation,
uh, through biblical teaching so that when they go out there, they're not the same people who don't have answers uh, for the things that are happening in their cultural context. So um, I don't know if anybody else can help with answering that question, but I think it's, it's something, it's a question that we all need to begin to think about. 